Masters, there's something bizarre that we've discovered about the inhibitor chips. Anakin tells the council. Anakin tells the council, bowing his head respectfully. Obi-Wan strokes his beard. Oh, and what strange things did you find about the inhibitor chips? We were told that they were simply in the clones' heads to allow them to have more loyalty to the Republic and to follow orders better, he says. Anakin looks over to Rex. Perhaps you'd better explain this one, Captain, he says. Yes, sir! Rex says, saluting. After sleuthing around General Skywalker, we have determined that there are a number of contingency plans baked into the chips that will force clones to comply with them. My brother, Fives, died trying to bring this information to the public and to the Chancellor. General Skywalker and I don't want him to have died in vain. In our investigations, we believe that we have evidence of what Fives was telling us, he says. Mm. Tell us about these contingencies, you must. Concerning? Why are they? Yoda inquires. Perhaps for the good of the Republic? They are. Anakin looks towards Rex, who shoots him a sharp glance in return. Master Yoda, there's one specific contingency order that, if activated, could result in the execution of the entire Jedi Order, Anakin replies. Murmurs of anxiety echo through the Jedi Council. If activated, this would force troopers across the galaxy to turn on the Jedi Generals, and they will be perceived as traitors to the Republic. There will be nothing that we will be able to do to stop this, Rex continues. My brothers will literally be turned into droids for the sake of wiping all of you out. There's a silence in the Jedi Council chambers for a moment. Each of the Masters eye one another, speaking their shared secret language that nobody else could understand. Finally, Mace Windu speaks up. If what you've told us is true, Skywalker, then we are all in grave danger, he says. We need to begin preparations immediately. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if the Jedi Order had known about Order 66? Well, if so, get ready for a wild ride. Sit down and enjoy a well-prepared bowl of Bantha stew and prepare, because this is what if the Jedi Council knew about Order 66. After seeing Fives' death and seeing how Rex had reacted to it, Anakin begins to become suspicious that something is awry. He doesn't exactly know what, but he knows that something is up. Fives had always been an exceptional soldier, and it didn't seem like him to just snap in the way that he did. Even Rex confides in Anakin, saying that he had been a little hesitant not to believe what the galaxy was saying about Fives and what the government was saying about him. So, after the incident, the two of them began to look deeper into the inhibitor chips, along with their true purpose, knowing that that's what Fives had been talking about. They actually go to Kamino and land, and decide to have a conversation with Lana Su, the Prime Minister of Kamino. Ah, oh, Master Skywalker, how good it is to see you on Kamino, the Prime Minister says. Prime Minister, Anakin continues. Would you mind if we had a brief chat in your office, he says. Rex and Anakin go into Lamasu's office and sit down, and they're offered a glass of Bantha brew, but they refuse. To what do I owe the pleasure, Master Skywalker, he says. Anakin looks back at him. I want to know all about these inhibitor chips. Every last detail. And I know for a fact that it isn't just to keep the clones more passive and ready to follow orders. No, no. Fives was a good soldier, and something was up with him. So, tell me now. At first, Lama Su simply looks at him funny. What do you think is going on? We already explained the inhibitor chips, and Fives had a malfunction that led him to- No, Rex says. I don't believe that Fives had a malfunction. He was a good soldier, following orders, and you treat us like property. We are people, humans, soldiers, and you Kaminoans just treat us like your little products. No, I don't believe you, Rex says. Anakin looks at Lama Su again. Tell me now. Some of his more violent inclinations begin to come out. He acts in the way that he did around Trench and Rush Clovis during the Clone Wars. He says that he would expose their entire operation to the Republic if he didn't. The Prime Minister smirks. Well, you would have a hard time 
proving anything, Skywalker. Especially because it was just one defective clone that caused problems. Lama Su looks towards Rex when he says this, feeling the rage of the clone. Anakin then raises the Prime Minister up with force, choking his long neck. Then I guess I'm gonna have to have a different strategy then, Anakin says. Lama Su continues to grasp at her neck, begging that Anakin put her down. Please, Skywalker, put me down, he says. Finally, Anakin drops him. Now, will you tell me? That's when the Prime Minister tells Anakin about all the contingency plans and everything in the chips that made them what they were. Vibes had discovered what had malfunctioned with Tup, he says, and he'd been right all along. Anakin then looks at Lama Su in his eyes. What are your motivations for the Kaminoans to possibly have created such contingencies against the Jedi, against the Republic? They were simply, as the name states, contingencies. They're a failsafe, only intended to be used under the most dire of circumstances. While the death of Fives is unfortunate, this had been a conspiracy theory rabbit hole that he'd been descending down. He was far too inside of his head to be an effective soldier. Rex shoots him a venomous look. <laughs> What do you know about being a good soldier? Rex says, turning away. Anakin looks back at the Kaminoan and shakes his head. I pity you. Then, the two of them leave Kamino. Rex, we have to inform the Council about these contingency plans, he says. Rex nods. Absolutely, sir. I am 100% on board. As soon as we land on Coruscant, we will tell the Council, he says. This would be something that would open up the door to many possibilities for the Council in the future. On the way back to Coruscant, Anakin calls Obi-Wan immediately. Master, it's good to see you, he says. Yes, Anakin, hello, how are you today? Anakin then begins telling him about everything that had transpired with Lama Su. Their contingency plans, Anakin says. There'd be no choice if the inhibitor chips are activated for these clones to follow the orders either, even if we were to not actually betray the Republic, Anakin says. Obi-Wan strokes his beard. Sir, I can confirm what General Skywalker's saying is true. I was there. Fives had been right about everything. Obi-Wan nods. This is deeply concerning information, he says. Do you two have proof? Rex had recorded Lama Su's confession after Anakin worked it out of her via aggressive negotiations, and he presents the holotape to Kenobi. Very good, Obi-Wan says. Once you return to Coruscant, I will call an emergency meeting of the Jedi Council to discuss this evidence. Then we will determine next steps. Goodbye, old friend. I'll see you on Coruscant, Obi-Wan says, concluding the call. Rex then looks towards Anakin. What do you think this information will do, Skywalker? He says. What do you mean? Anakin asks. Do you think it'll only exacerbate tensions between the Council and the Republic? Or do you think that perhaps this will bring some unity against the Chancellor? Anakin shakes his head. I don't know, Rex. But I have my duty to the Jedi Order to tell about these orders. And I think that we're going the right direction. In that moment, Rex decides to ask Anakin a favor. General, I don't want to be a slave to this inhibitor chip. I want to be a three-thinking man. I don't want to be no droid, he says. Remove it for me, please, General. I beg you. I want to be loyal to you, to my generals, to the Republic. Not to some weird robotic chip in my head. I want to be the Rex from Umbara, not some slave to the Senate. All right, Rex, I understand, Anakin says. So he obliges, putting Rex to sleep and removing his chip while on the ship ride back to Coruscant. When Anakin arrives on Coruscant, Obi-Wan is there to greet him and Rex immediately. Ah, excellent, Anakin. The Council is waiting to hear what you have to say, he says. So, Anakin hurries in with his clone captain, ready to tell them all about the contingency plans along with Fives. When they arrive, Yoda asks Anakin to inform them of the situation. Mm, tell us what is going on, you must, he says. Anakin tells them all about what happened with Lamassu and the contingency plans, just like he had told Obi-Wan earlier. 
Yoda frowns. Hmm. If real, these are. In incredibly grave danger, we are, he says. Then he proceeds to ask the council what they should do. There's a small debate between different people on the Jedi Council, and many of them sit in silence, stroking their beards, wondering what the possible way to go is. However, Kiari Mundi has the idea that seems to capture the crowd the most. What if we begin secretly regrouping the Jedi survivors as possible, and send them to Tython, so that if the Sith do wipe us clean, we could endure it, he says. Having a refuge that is isolated from the rest of the galaxy, along with being somewhere that the Sith have a hard time accessing, this seems to be a feasible option to me, he says. Mmm, agree with this, I do, Yoda says. Think that this is a good idea. I do, he continues. So, Yoda then orders that some of the younger Jedi Knights, Padawans, and younglings begin relocating to Tython as soon as possible. Any volunteers do we have to lead this initiative? Mm -hmm. Yoda says. For a moment, the council is silent. However, eventually, Obi-Wan raises his hand. I will do this, Master Yoda, he says. I believe that this is an excellent initiative, and I will take charge. Mm -hmm. Very good. Decided it is. Master Kenobi, head this initiative, you will. Other big Jedi officials, such as Yoda, and the council members decide to stay on Coruscant as to not arouse suspicion from the Senate or from Palpatine. Yoda looks towards Anakin. Mm. Master Skywalker, ready are you to commit to a more important role in this plan? Mm? Anakin looks back at Yoda and nods. Yes, Master, he says. Certain are you? Your allegiance with the Jedi, it is. Mm? Yoda continues. Anakin nods. Yes, Master. Even if I have my disagreements with the Council, I am loyal to this order. Hmm. Good. The Council wants you to continue to keep an eye on the Chancellor. They do. To see if he ever intends to use these contingency plans, he says. In addition, find a reason for this, you must, and report back. He says, I fear that there is a grave danger to this council, Mace Windu says, and I believe that this plot to destroy the Jedi is beginning to unravel. The darkness is clearing, he says. It seems like the Chancellor is at the center of it all. Anakin, who at this point is also suspicious of Palpatine, looks towards Rex. Rex, are you willing to stay with me on Coruscant for some time? I believe that you could be a special help to me in this task, he asks. Absolutely, General Skywalker. Anything for you, he says, snapping to attention and saluting. Great. Then begin spreading word of these contingencies to the other commanders, and we will see what happens in the near future, he says. Before Obi-Wan leaves to Tython to try and begin sending all of the other Jedi there, he has to say goodbye to Anakin. On the landing pad, as many Jedi are funneling into one of the many starships that are there, he wishes Anakin the best. Good luck, Anakin, Obi-Wan says, giving his brother a hug. I'll miss you. May the Force be with you. I've taught you everything that I know, and you are going to be a stellar Jedi, he says. I'm proud of everything that you're doing right now. Anakin smiles back. I'm proud of everything you're doing to protect the Order, Master. Good luck, and may the Force be with you. Perhaps after this entire ordeal, the Council might even make you a Master, Anakin. He says, <laughs> Anakin laughs, Oh, I'm not so sure about that, but I won't get my hopes up. But thank you for the encouragement, Obi-Wan. Then, Obi-Wan departs, with many of the Jedi ready to start the new organization on Tython. Anakin, who's now on special assignment with the Senate, is officially tasked to be in charge of the Chancellor's heightened security as the war continues to progress. And, so, he's able to spend a significant time with Palpatine. He often sits in Padme's senate pod with her, and he tells her about how he's suspicious of the Chancellor's intentions. Anakin tells her about what he had discovered on Kamino, and Padme frowns. Huh, that's odd. Given the fact that the Jedi's loyalty to the Republic is unwavering, I don't even see the need for those contingency plans, she says. 
Yes, Padme. And even more bizarre is the fact that these chips force soldiers to follow the order, at least according to Fives, and I believe him, especially after talking to Lamassu. Even if the Jedi generals aren't involved at all in any plot. At this, Padme strokes her chin as Padme gives his speech, considering the bizarre nature of these chips. Something was clearly afoot, and Anakin doesn't like that he can't sense what it is. Meanwhile, Rex continues to tell his clone brothers about Fives, and many of them start to remove their inhibitor chips. Cody, Wolf, Hauser, Hunter, Scorch, and many of the other members of those respective units believe Rex, and they listen to him about Fives. However, there are others out there, such as Commander Fox, who believe that Rex is simply stirring up trouble, and that removing their chips would get them into massive bantha poodoo if they're discovered. So, not all of the clones listen to Rex, and this begins to cause a divide between those who did listen, and those who did not. One day, after Chancellor Palpatine gives the rousing speech in the Senate, and takes control of the banks, followed by a raucous applause from the chamber, Anakin decides it would be prudent to begin prying at the Chancellor, when he is securing his detail during the travels back to his office, and Anakin is watching him, he starts to inquire about his motives. Chancellor, I don't mean to be rude, but you've stayed in office long after your term has expired, and you are consolidating a significant amount of power to the executive branch. I just don't understand. It seems to many outsiders that you are attempting to take control of the government. This isn't very democratic, Chancellor, and I'm curious about what your reasoning is. Palpatine then looks at him and tells him something very prudent. Oh, my boy, if the Senate demanded that this happen, I didn't want to extend my term and I didn't want to take control of the banks, but this is what the people wanted. This is democracy in action, Anakin. Then, following that, Anakin takes a brief pause and he asks the Chancellor a very important question. What happened with Fives? He asks. And what's going on with the clones' inhibitor chips? Palpatine frowns. Oh, my boy, what happened to Fives was incredibly unfortunate, but that was a clone with a defective chip who attacked me. He attacked me! Crazy. I'm very sorry. He was a good soldier, Anakin, but he needed to go. Anakin, not wanting to pursue this topic any further, simply nods. I understand, Chancellor, he says, narrowing his eyes. However, Palpatine can sense Anakin's distrust. Perhaps he would have to wait longer to find his new apprentice. Because Anakin is assigned to Palpatine for special security, he's with him when the surprise attack on Coruscant is conducted by Dooku and Grievous in the skies above the metropolis. As skies are lined with ships and conflict breaks out, prompting battle droids and clones to battle in the streets of the Republic capital, blasting each other with blue and red plasma, forcing civilians to run for cover wherever they could, Anakin protects the Chancellor, shielding him from blaster fire alongside Mace Windu, who is also on Coruscant during this time. Kit Fisto leads the attack in the sky, weaving fighters in and out of the vulture droid hordes and ensuring that these droids above Coruscant are annihilated. Meanwhile, Yoda uses his abilities and communication skills along with his special prowess to guide civilians to safety and allow for them to find cover as the barrage of the streets ensues. As Mace and Anakin continue to move through the streets with the Chancellor, suddenly they are faced with the mechanical beast that is General Grievous, who lands on the street in front of them and cackles viciously. He then ignites his four lightsabers with his strange, whirring arms and challenges them to a duel, ready to kill more Jedi dogs. Together, Anakin and Mace Windu dance with Grievous, engaging him with multiple strikes and crazy acrobatic hits with offense. Mace Windu uses Vapod to use Grievous' dark energy against him, and Anakin, the master duelist that he is, continues to keep the strange cyborg on his feet. Together, they're able to chop off a couple of his hands and distract him long enough to run away with the Chancellor, getting him to safety. However, the massive amount of droids swarming the streets still manage to snatch up Palpatine as they're trying to escape. The Jedi are simply outnumbered, and they can't deal with the hordes and encroaching army of the Separatists. 
Following this, Mace Windu and Anakin hop into their starfighters to chase Grievous away, ready to apprehend the Chancellor. Windu and Anakin zoom towards the Invisible Hand, darting through ship after ship and crashing through vulture droids and buzz droids, before finally landing in the hangar with the help of some ARC pilots in the background who have blasted a clear path for them. They slice and dice many droids on their way to the Chancellor, just like Obi-Wan and Anakin did in Revenge of the Sith. And when they arrive, they see him bound, overlooking the battle outside of the ship. The pair of them still engage Dooku as he hops off of the balcony towards them. And they slice and dice with Dooku, who is still the master duelist in his prime, but with Mace Windu, who uses his dark side energy against him, and Anakin Skywalker, who continues to use his offensive prowess to overpower Dooku's skill, they end up defeating Dooku together, and they emerge victorious. However, in this moment, the Chancellor still looks at Anakin and asks him to kill Dooku. Kill him. Kill him now, the Chancellor says. Anakin looks at him sideways. Mace Windu also looks at Chancellor Palpatine in a strange way. Why do you want him dead, Palpatine? He asks. Is there something that you're hiding? He can be a very high-value prisoner to the Republic, Anakin says. The Chancellor looks back at him. Anakin, I believe that killing him would be the best thing to end this war once and for all. Cut the head off of the snake, so to speak. Kill him now, Palpatine says. Anakin shakes his head. Just like you killed fives, Palpatine? Just like you want to kill all of the Jedi? Palpatine looks at Anakin in shock. Whatever do you mean, Skywalker, he says. I know about your plans. I know about the contingencies. I know everything. I've been suspicious of you for months. Anakin looks towards Mace Windu. This is the Sith Lord that we've been looking for. He is the reason that these contingency plans exist. I know it. Mace Windu then nods. I agree, Skywalker. We must take him out for the good of the Republic. Anakin raises his saber towards Palpatine's throat, who is still bound, and Palpatine begins to panic. Immediately, Palpatine looks towards the small microphone that's implanted in the side of his robes and tries to utter the words, Execute Order 66, as quickly as he can. As he does so, though, Anakin slices him down, cutting him at the neck, decapitating Palpatine, and the Chancellor is dead. Following Palpatine's shocking execution, Dooku is apprehended by Mace and Skywalker. He ends up giving his large testimony to the Senate, telling them about the plot to destroy the Jedi and take over the galaxy. Now, however, he feels guilty and says that he sees he had been manipulated by Palpatine the entire time. Everything comes to light, and the clones who did not agree with Rex's removal of their inhibitor chips now see what he'd been talking about. They follow suit, removing theirs so that they wouldn't be reduced to mere droids. Anakin remains with the Jedi, and Windu commends him for his actions aboard the Invisible Hand. However, after a few months, Anakin can't reconcile living his double life with Padme. So, as Dooku had decided to do, Anakin leaves the order to raise his children with Padme on Naboo. She also ends up leaving the Senate, knowing that Bail Organa, the successor to Palpatine as the Chancellor, will do an excellent job in office. The war with the Separatists continues to rage on, especially with Grievous now becoming the figurehead of the Confederacy movement. He simply refuses to die. However, without Palpatine manipulating both sides of the conflict, it starts to come closer to a resolution between the two factions. The galaxy starts to become more and more peaceful, and it seems like there is a light at the end of the tunnel for the Confederacy and for the Republic. Hey there everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video, and you know what, somehow I managed to get another special guest on the show today, and this one's an old favorite, I think that you will appreciate who's coming on today, somehow the busiest man in the galaxy managed to have time to just come and sit down with me for a little chat, so I would like everyone to welcome Emperor Palpatine to Bantha Stew, hello there Emperor, how are you doing today? Oh, I am doing quite well. How about you, Bent the Stew? Oh, you know, I'm doing pretty well, too. I just wanted to know what you thought of today's video. Uh, if I'm being honest, I didn't exactly love it. Oh, and why is that? 
Well, the dark side always prevails, and clearly you didn't capture that in your video. The power, the feelings, the adrenaline of using the dark side and twisting the force always comes out on top. Well, I'm not so sure about that, Palpatine. You know, there are lots of people, actually, who have been complaining about the Acolyte, saying that it twists the whole purpose of Star Wars from saying that evil is bad to sometimes evil is necessary and that it kind of misses the ball. I'm not 100% sure I agree with that entirely, but I see where they're coming from. And the whole point of Star Wars is that, you know, the light side always prevails. Luke overcame the darkness and he was able to bring his father back to the Jedi Order. He was able to turn Darth Vader back to the light side after he had fallen so far and committed so many atrocities. I also think that that's kind of the point of the sequel trilogy in a way too that everybody was redeemable even Ben Solo who in a way had lost himself completely in Kylo Ren but he was able to come back to the light and even though I don't necessarily love the execution of Rise of Skywalker and I thought it was a little bit contrived and stuff had been recycled from previous trilogies I still thought it was pretty cool how they redeemed Ben Solo even though I wish that they would have executed it better well, Ben Solo was a fool. I was able to overcome him easily. That false dyad thing, him and Ray. Oh, if only I had been at my full peak power and I had had a body that was able to contain the raw energy of the Sith that I contained, I would have been able to overcome Ray. You know... It would have been really easy to just have stopped shooting her with lightning, right? You totally could have done that. And the same with Mace Windu. I, I don't understand why you didn't just stop shooting them with lightning. Well, you see, I was so consumed by my hatred, and I was so enveloped in the dark side, that using that power required me to continue utilizing that full force of the dark side and I couldn't stop it was consuming me eating me alive and it was almost as though the power was too great for me I was merely a vessel of the raw energy of the dark side and while intoxicating it can lead to the demise of even the most powerful force users so let me ask you, Palpatine, why did you continue using the dark side if you knew that that was a possibility? Well, because it is fun, and I feel so much power. The restrictions of the Jedi are foolish. I alone harness the dark side. I alone am the embodiment of all of the Sith who came before me. I am their chosen one. And using the Force to create a galaxy in my image and to harness raw power, it is simply a feeling like no other, Mr. Bantha. Well, I mean, I suppose that makes sense. Like, personally, I might have some ethical issues with manipulating people and killing people in order to get to the top and, like, orchestrating an entire galactic war just to consolidate power, but I see that that's the way of the Sith, and you don't really care, do you? Not at all, Mr. Bantha. All I crave is raw power. Well, good for you, man. Like, I, again, I don't agree with it, and I think you might have missed the ball there, and I think that it's kind of funny that you guys didn't find the secret to eternal life, even though you've been searching and searching and searching for years, whereas the Jedi could just become Force ghosts. You totally could have done that, but you didn't, so... Wait, what do you mean, Force ghosts? Well... I thought you would have known. Qui-Gon was able to at least transfer his essence into the Force and manifest in a voice. Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Anakin all managed to actually manifest as real, f tangible Force ghosts. And they preserved their energy, and they were able to come back as representatives of the Living Force. Oh, how interesting. I thought that the only way to eternal life through the Force was to use the midi-chlorians to create life. 
Have you ever heard the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, Mr. Bentha? Oh, I've heard it far too many times, thanks. And I see why it was such a tragedy. He was a very wise man, but again, he used his powers for evil, and he got caught up in arrogance, which I think is the ultimate failure of the dark side. You get caught up in your own arrogance and your own selfishness, whereas the Jedi are able to preserve their order because they actually care for one another. Well, do they truly, or do they only care about the preservation of their own power? Now, that's an awfully Sith thing to say. Honestly, I would love to continue this conversation, but I think that it's going on a little too far, and I would love to have you back for another episode of the show. Thank you for coming on just for these brief five minutes. We can talk about the nature of the Jedi Order versus the Sith Order next time you're on, if you'd like. Oh, I would love to, Mr. Bantha. I love debating the ways and philosophies of the Force. I would be happy to hop on once again. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you for coming on. And because you're Emperor of the Galaxy, because you're such a respectable ruler, I'll let you close out for me today, okay? Ah, lovely. Can I say the line? Of course you can say the line, Darth Sidious. You can say any line you want. I really don't want you electrocuting me, so... Uh, uh. Don't worry, Mr. Bantha. I like you. I would never. Thank you all for tuning in to today's video. If you enjoyed it, I would recommend writing a comment down below. Would you like to see a part two? What did you like? What do you think could have been done better? And if you do believe that a sequel is required, what do you think would happen next? I would love to see you in the Discord server as well. I personally am in the Discord, along with Darth Vitiate, one of the other most powerful Force users in history, someone that I aspire to be one day. I would also encourage you to speak with your other Star Wars fans, and continue to build this great community, dare I say, empire together. Once again, thank you for watching the video. I hope that the rest of your day is absolutely bantacular, and as always, I hope that you've had your daily delicious dose of bantha stew. Well, thank you, Sidious. I appreciate it, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you guys later.